In this video, we're going to look at the four most common questions that we receive from students about the dreaded literature review. We're going to be looking at one, what exactly is a literature review? What does it mean? Two, what is the function? What's the purpose? What is the literature review supposed to achieve? If we understand the why, then it'll make life a lot easier. Three, we're going to look at how do you find the right articles? How do you find the right resources to cover in your literature review? And four, how do you structure? What are the structures? options in terms of your literature review chapter. So grab a cup of coffee, grab a cup of tea, whatever you like, and let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Grad Coach TV, where we demystify and simplify the sometimes seemingly bizarre world of academia and research skills. Today, I'm going to be talking with Karen Warren, one of our very own grad coaches. Karen's a seasoned researcher. She has been published in various peer-reviewed journals. She's contributed towards textbook chapters. She's got a PhD, an MSc, a BSc. Basically, she knows what she's talking about when it comes to research. So today we're going to pick her brains and we're going to unpack all things literature review related. So let's get into it. Karen, welcome to Grad Coach TV. It's uh, awesome to have you here and I look forward to you dropping some knowledge bombs on us today. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and I'll try my best. Awesome. So. So let's start with the basics. We, we get a, a ton of students coming to us all the time. And probably the most common question that they ask is, what is a literature review? I've been told to do a literature review. I don't have a clue what it is. Do I just summarize everything that I've read? What is a literature review? So let's start there. Yeah, uh, I see what you mean. A lot of clients end up asking that exact question. And um, I think generally speaking, it's easier to think of the literature review as kind of being two things. The first thing is the, the process, the, um, the actually reviewing of the literature. And then the second part is seeing it uh, right. as a chapter. So as a chapter in your dissertation that is uh, looking at the literature. So the two things are essentially one, going and hunting down the literature, finding all the articles that you're going to review, and mm. then two, compiling that in some way into the chapter that fits into a dissertation or thesis. Is that about right? Exactly. Cool. Exactly. And in that first part, um, there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done. Obviously, you're going to be looking through various uh, databases or using Google Scholar to search for various literature, right. pieces of literature. You'll go into the library and look for books if you have access to it in non-COVID times. And um, yeah, and you'll just be looking through and reading and collating and organizing these uh, various pieces of literature as you read them into hopefully um, an organized space such as a spreadsheet or um, in a reference manager. And this will really help you out in the second phase, which is the writing and the collating and the synthesizing of this literature into that chapter. And um, that chapter is essentially foundational in that it shows what what you know about what's already been uh, researched and established. Right, right. So that second bit, that, um, that chapter, the actual um, uh, piece of writing that mm. one compiles, that's essentially a, a synthesis, a bringing together of all that literature um, in relation to exactly. what, whatever the student's researching, right? Exactly. Cool. Exactly. And, um, and there are many different ways of, of doing a literature review, but ultimately it's about that synthesizing of, of uh, the background research, the stuff that has already been done that fills in where you end up coming in for your research. Right, right. Uh, so, something that I uh, often uh, explain to students is that research is is built on existing research uh, mm. a lot of students uh, come along with the notion that they need to uh, 
essentially start from scratch and that's not where uh, or that's not how good research takes place but instead it's it's um, to, to, to quote from Newton um, it's about sort of standing on the shoulders of giants it's mm. about taking what's already been researched and adding to that so I think that's a, a useful way for students to understand the literature review it's about going and seeing what's already been said about whatever your, your research topic is whatever exactly. your questions are and then saying okay how can I take this further yes exactly and um, and that's ultimately what you're wanting to get out of that chapter. You're wanting to uh, showcase that you you know about uh, the giant on whose shoulder <laughs> you're standing, right, right. and uh, that that you know exactly uh, where where your um, information is fitting in. So research, as you said, is uh, not in a vac done in a vacuum. Um, you're coming in and you're presenting something new, but something new within the context of a lot of different things that have already been done over hundreds of years. Right. So it's very important to show that you know where you fit in. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, and that's one of the one of the things that you want to achieve from the literature review. So to wrap this up, to answer this question of what is a literature review, essentially we can see it as as two things or at least two parts of a process. The one is Mm. the actual reviewing of the literature, reviewing what's been done in the past. Mm. And the second is writing up the literature review chapter in which you kind of bring together all that stuff you read. Is that is that a good answer to the question of what is a literature review? Yes, yes. And I think the, the, the useful part of seeing it as two processes is that you ultimately can be a little bit more gentle on yourself in the first part. Right, you right. don't need to know it until you've read some things. Gotcha. You don't need to be able to sit and write as you read. Right. You should be able to digest and learn um, before you get into the writing process. This is helpful because I think a lot of people um, feel like they don't really know where to start. Right. And uh, the answer really is actually, uh, the first part is the starting, right. the learning right. is the starting. Right. So, mm -hmm. so in simple terms, read before you write or at least give, your, give, yes. your, give yourself license to, to read and absorb information before you even think about exactly. writing a literature review. Exactly. And I think so, something that I've seen with students as well is that they initially have an idea of what their research topic is and, and what direction they're going to take things. Mm. But then as they start reviewing more and more of the literature, that research direction changes a little bit oh, because yes. they, they, they become more familiar with, okay, what has been done, what hasn't been done, where, where are the gaps? And so yes. I think it's quite natural natural for for the literature review in itself to to even change the direction of what a student might be thinking about in terms of their research topic of course and in good research you want that you want uh, right. you want to be informed and you want to be able to be a little bit malleable provided that um, a lot of the practicalities aren't affected sure. Um, sure. but yes you, you want the literature to inform you as well it should be almost like a, a give and a take scenario you need to be a little bit flexible um, while you're going into that literature space awesome so i think we have done a semi-decent job of answering question <laughs> number one, which is, what is a literature review? All right, so on to our next question, which is, what is the purpose? What's the function of the literature review? Mm. And uh, mm. uh, our viewers are probably watching and thinking, Derek, why are you asking such a mundane question? And, and, <laughs> and my answer to that is that in my mind, and, and this is something that I say to students all the time, it's really important to understand why you're doing something before you go and do mm. it. If you understand mm. the purpose <laughs> of any section of a dissertation or thesis or a research project, yes. if you understand what, what this thing is supposed to do, then your chances of actually doing it well are going to be much better. As, as Simon Sinek says, mm. start with why. So, so let's start with yes. why. Um, and, and let me ask you, what is the purpose? What are the functions of a literature review, generally speaking? Yeah, um, actually, the why, as you said, is such an important part of this. Um, if you're thinking about um, who's going to be looking, who's going to be reading your dissertation, and who's going to be evaluating your dissertation, or any piece of writing, really, um, what you really want to make sure is that you're ticking a whole bunch of boxes and you're uh, ultimately then able to pass. And so the why is actually a really right. important question right. because you're wanting to make sure that you're ticking those boxes. Right. In the context of a literature review, uh, 
it's important to know the why because it actually seems otherwise quite vague. Yeah. So what you tend to see is that everybody thinks, okay, the literature review is me just sort of splurging out yeah. every sort of thing I've happened to come across yeah. on Google and Scholar. Me, me waffle and on <laughs> everything I've read. <laughs> Exactly. And then you sort of see these people um, or see these dissertations where uh, sort of every single paragraph is showing that they really read this piece of literature yeah. and they understood it. And that's really not what you're trying to do. You're trying to show that, uh, yes, you've read the literature. But more importantly, I think the main purpose, the first purpose of a literature review is to show that you understand the literature. You understand right. the themes, the arguments, the models that have been proposed, and you're coming in from this angle of truly understanding and engaging with those arguments, right. models, right. theories that have previously been done. Right, which, mm. which makes perfect sense because as we, as we touched on in the last question, this is about building on other people's work, right? It's about standing on the shoulders mm. of, of those giants. And so it makes mm. sense that, that a really important function of the literature review is, is to show that you do know what those people said. You didn't just go and skim mm. read them. Um, you actually yes. went, you actually went and, and, and engaged with the literature. You understand what these people have said. You understand what the strengths and weaknesses of, of their, their approaches were. Mm. And, and I guess, quite frankly, that you know your stuff, right? Exactly, exactly. Not just that you can uh, summarize a paper right. <laughs> into two or three sentences, right. but that you really understood where that paper or where those papers fit in together. Yeah. And this can be very overwhelming initially, but there are ways and means to go about synthesizing this a little bit more easily. Yeah. But the idea really, and um, my general advice when it comes to showcasing that particular purpose is to actually just once you've done some readings not look at them yeah. and kind of just jot down hey what what what, what was i actually learning what was i actually yeah. Yeah. Uh, reading really yeah. um, and then you can really get those theories okay cool so what are the other functions of the literature review there, there are two others that, uh, and I'll, I'll focus on the second one because the second one is also really important for this particular chapter, is um, that in showcasing your knowledge of the literature, you also want to showcase what the literature doesn't say, if that makes any sense. You're wanting to yeah. <laughs> show the, the gap. The gap. Right? The yeah, gap. exactly. You want to show the gap. Um, and the important part about showcasing that and highlighting that you know that is that Ultimately, well, hopefully, your research is fitting into that gap, right? That your literature right. or your, your piece of writing, your thesis, your dissertation is going to somehow be um, looking into that gap, peering into the deep, if you are. But you want to kind of show yeah. Yeah. Um, that there is that sort of building, that, uh, that, that framework around it, that, um, that right. literature around it. And that, there it is. That's the gap. Right. So, mm -hmm. so in, in simple terms, it's about showing that there's a need for, for your research, showing that, exactly. that <laughs> one, you've, you've, you've gone and read what others have had to say, yeah. and, uh, and two, that you've, you've found where the holes are, where the potential missing pieces of the puzzle are. Exactly. Perhaps there were, uh, perhaps, you know, the context changed and now there's a, there's a yeah. new gap that uh, didn't exist previously. So it's, exactly. it's essentially a justification for your own topic. It's really, really important exactly. in, in terms of arguing that your topic's original, right? Mm, mm, precisely. Um, and, and this could be done in many ways. It could be the situation that uh, this has been explored in other contexts, but maybe not in uh, yeah. your country or in your hometown right. or at your right. university. Um, and right. Or it could be um, that it has been explored using other methodologies, but not the methodology that adds this extra little bit of insight in some way. And so you're wanting to show right. that's where the gap is. Um, and here I am merging these two things, the context and um the piece that I'm wanting to know, if essentially. <laughs> gotcha, mm. gotcha. So what's the what's the third um, uh, golden oh. <laughs> component of, of the literature review recipe? What is the third function? Well, the third function is actually um, really practical. Um, I I have a, a saying where um, where which I say to clients and students is that at the end of the the literature review, you don't want to leave 
everyone on a cliffhanger. You don't want them to think, oh, what are they going to do next? You actually want it to be pretty obvious what your methodology, what your next step is going to be, because right. you would have t- yeah. essentially sort of covered it in some way. So the third important part of the literature review is to essentially somehow showcase the methodologies that have been done and showcase which ones might be more practical in terms of perhaps evaluating that gap. So it's not that you're going to be doing a, a complete review of the of the methodology before you've even done it it's just showcasing mm. that you understand where you are needed in this bigger picture but from a more practical right. perspective um, and in right. some ways this has sort of two components you're going to be doing the readings anyway uh, and you're going to be yeah. seeing the methodologies yeah. all the various methodologies that have been used in the past to answer similar questions uh, that you have, and so it's it's important to see what people have done, to know right. what has been successful, to know what hasn't been successful, and to ultimately right. be able to justify why perhaps your your next steps will be done the way they are using right. that literature. And um, also quite practically is that your methodology isn't going to be coming out of nowhere and testing nothing. It's going to be testing a series of hypotheses or perhaps a conceptual or theoretical framework, which you really already have to have needed to have proposed, (laughs) if that makes any sense. Yeah, so it's it's essentially in... In a similar way that one uses the the literature review to, to sort of justify the topic, to sort of show the gap mm. in terms of topic, you can use the literature review to justify your methodology. And I, and I guess that can, exactly. that can swing in, in, in two potential ways. It could be that um, the, there is a gap in the literature in that um, a certain methodological approach hasn't been used and therefore the, there's mm. value in potentially doing it that way. Or you could potentially mm. argue it in a different direction, which is to say that this is the most sensible methodology to use um, in this area of research as has been demonstrated by previous studies. Totally. So I guess, it, I guess it could swing in, in, in either way, but the point is yes. you need to be paying attention to methodologies in the literature review and that needs to inform what, what you do with your own methodology, right? Exactly. Exactly. And to to bear in mind that you're not writing a thriller or a crime novel, you're writing (laughs) something that uh, that even though there might be an element of dryness to this approach is that it should be really obvious what you're about to do and why. And (laughs) and, uh, you don't want people having way too many questions at the end of your literature review. Yeah, I I always advise students, if if you want to write well, um, writes with the objective of holding the reader's hand. Don't don't mm. assume that they're thinking what you're thinking. Don't assume that they understand exactly. what your argument is. Hold their hand and walk them through the process of your thinking and walk them through, help them understand sort of where you've been and where you're going. And uh, if you exactly. take that mindset of making no assumptions about what the reader knows, then that generally makes for much better reading. Um, Oh, totally, totally agree. And you know what, if you do end up over describing, if you do end up being a little bit repetitive at some point, you can always edit that down. It's far easier to just whittle things down than to, um, to, than to have to re-expand, re-explore more literature, right. find extra pieces. You're right. Hold their hand right. and uh, guide them. Right. And just uh, one, one extra point on uh, this concept of, of methodology and how that fits into the literature review. Uh, a more practical component is also that when you're reviewing um, uh, quantitative studies, quite often they will share um, the, the the scales and the measures that they used, and that can be used uh, exactly. very often verbatim. And these are these are scales and measures that have been tested, that have uh, you know they they are they are quality tools to use in your own research. And so you can exactly. essentially sort of steal like an artist in terms of <laughs> u- using um, uh, tools that have been tried and tested already, as opposed to trying to develop your own measures, which probably won't be hugely successful, at least not the first time around. 
Exactly. And quite often, even if you were to use your own uh, methods or your own measures or your own techniques, mm -hmm. you'll have to justify why you do so. Yeah. And if there's already these things in the literature, you have to have brought them up. You can't just sort of ignore them. Right. So right. you have to say, well, there are these, the, the, perhaps there are these survey instruments mm -hmm. um, and they tested X, Y, Z, but they're not quite uh, in line with my particular need. Right. Um, yeah. And as long as you're able to justify that, then it's fine. But you right. really do have to at least somewhat engage with the methodology. And this actually goes to the reviewing process of articles. Um, a lot of uh, students and clients would have asked me, should they read every word in every single article? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, no, please don't. <laughs> um, because that would just be a waste of time at best. Um, and, and quite boring and very stressful at worst yeah, yeah. and um yeah and i think one of my techniques when it comes to reading is to actually um read the abstract that's always the trick right yeah. um and then to kind of just hop through to the methodology to kind of uh, see if they kind of were doing what you kind of need them mm -hmm. to do <laughs> right. if, they, if they're doing what something that you wanted to do right. um and then kind of just to evaluate that as a quick second step yeah uh, that's not to say don't ever read the full article. It's just <laughs> sure. to say that if you're wanting to see what people are doing um, and, and where you might fit in, that's a nice second step to do. Cool. So to recap this, this, this broader question of what is the purpose of the literature review, the first purpose is show that you know your stuff, show that you have read mm. and you have engaged and you, you understand what the sort of state of knowledge is uh, with, within, exactly. your, within your realm. Um, the, the, uh, the second point is that based on what you've read, you then need to use that to justify your gap, to justify your area of research, exactly. show that there's, there's this gap and that you're going to fill it. And then the third function, as we spoke about, was methodology, that you should be drawing on the methodologies that were used in all the studies that you reviewed to sort of inform your, your approach. And ideally, if, you, if you're doing um, a quantitative study, you should be able to borrow some of the, um, the instruments and, and the, the, the tools that are already um, tested and, and tried out in that environment. Precisely. Cool. So I think we've done a decent job of answering Great. that. On to the next one. All right. So on to the next question, which is a question that we get very often, <laughs> which is quite simply, how do you find the right literature? Right? Yeah. We've spoken about what a literature review is. We've spoken about the need to go and review all the, all the pertinent literature. But how does a student that's fresh into research, how, how did they actually go and find uh, mm. the literature that they need? And how, how, how did they assess, you know, whether something's relevant or not? Where, where, what's the starting point for a new researcher? I, I think actually, if you're going to start off really fresh, um, <laughs> then I'm going to tell you something that uh, you didn't technically hear from me, but um, don't be too shy with actually just starting on uh, Wikipedia and kind of just seeing <laughs> what articles. Ah, I know, I know, you can totally edit this out. <laughs> um, and seeing what articles uh, have been referenced on the topic already. This essentially helps you by showing you that you at least have the broader picture, the very yeah. basic, probably really crude viewpoints of the topic. Yeah. But uh, when you want to formally get into it, when you want to actually do this pro properly and seriously, you're wanting to use um, either a search database or, and, and this is one of my favorites, or just go into Google Scholar. Um, right. Using Google Scholar in particular is incredibly uh, important because it just has, it just allows you to look at everything. <laughs> Everything yeah. that's been published, yeah. everywhere that it's kept, it essentially is just, it's a search engine. It just allows you to just see everything that's out there already. So um, Google, Sp Google Scholar is my first good go-to, if that makes any sense. Good or higher quality go-to, if that makes any sense. And it makes sense be because mm. the the academic um, databases, they, they tend to, although they are rich with information, they just don't have the... I guess the search engine capabilities that Google has quite naturally, exactly. right? Google's, Google's this 
massive tech <laughs> exactly. company um, they understand search and so uh, I, I often find exactly. that it's just so much easier to find something with Google Scholar um, using a few keywords as opposed to the, the, the database from a university which might be quite frankly pretty dumb you know you, you're entering <laughs> keywords and it, sometimes they just throw absolute rubbish at you so oh, totally. that's definitely, definitely a great starting point to to just jump back to to your previous comment about wikipedia i think wikipedia Ooh. gets it, it <laughs> no it's not, it's not bad it's not bad i think wikipedia gets a bad rap in, in academic circles because the mistake that students make is they go and reference Wikipedia. So they go mm. and cite Wikipedia as a source. And of course, yes. Wikipedia is not a particularly reliable source, but what it is good at is exactly what you've mentioned is to use it as a starting point for seeing, okay, so what are the sources that I should be looking at? This Wikipedia yes. article, Wikipedia is pretty good at listing out what all the sources are. So um, exactly. on any given topic, it's probably gonna link to the sort of the key academic resources and articles in that space. So so yeah, we, we, we won't slam Wikipedia, we'll slam references yeah. Wikipedia, but, <laughs> but using it as a starting yeah. point, absolutely, it makes sense, Wikipedia and, and Google Scholar, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Just just to make sure that you kind of know maybe the language. I think I think that is a big thing for a lot of students. And yeah. it was a big thing for me. Um, uh, if I have to remember some, some of my first reading for my PhD, um, luckily yeah. I'd done a master's before, so I, I was kind of, I knew this was going to happen. But I don't think I understood a single full sentence in the entire <laughs> right, right. paper, first paper that I read. Um, so what's really nice about using um, Wikipedia, or in my case, I also used a, uh, a biology textbook, uh, yeah. was that it kind of just brought me up to, in terms of the terms, the terminologies, yeah. the way that it's collated, how to correlate right. it simply. And right. so it was just a really just dirty overview, but you kind of sometimes just need that dirty overview just to kind of, yeah. kind of just find your feet. And yeah. then, then you have the words, and the important thing about 100%. having the words is that you can pop them into Google Scholar. Exactly, and, rinse and repeat, right? <laughs> exactly, and, and and the nice thing with Google Scholar is it'll give you higher quality items. So, right. so right. once you come to terms with the terminologies, the phrasing, um, the the maybe uh, just a little bit of the lingo, the jargon. Yeah. Then, uh, then the searching part actually becomes a little bit easier. So yeah, yeah. It, ma it makes a lot of sense because because academics do love using big words, <laughs> and uh, they're not always the ones that you would think of, right? It's uh, no. It, it, you can find I know I know when I was was writing my dissertation on on organizational trust. Mm -hmm. um, trust. What what I was looking at was what are the, the, the drivers of trust? What are the things that tend to um, uh, cultivate trust? Yes. And the words that were used were drivers of trust, antecedents of trust, um, <laughs> uh, uh, geez, any, any number of words which basically meant things that create trust. Mm. And if you don't have the, if you don't try out all those keywords, you just, you, you might think, okay, well, I've, I have scratched at one of the bottom of the barrel and there's just nothing here. Exactly. But actually there's still loads of stuff. It's just that in that space, um, perhaps, you know, the seminal research used a certain word and then everyone just carried with that. And then for oh, some totally. reason, everyone thing is known as the antecedents <laughs> instead of just you know a simpler word exactly um, so 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 yeah it is really really important i think when when we're talking about this thing of how do you find research how do you find literature first find out what are the words that people use to describe Precisely. the thing that you're actually <laughs> that you're researching right <laughs> Well, yes, I, that's that's exactly it. Is is that sometimes you just don't know, and as you said, something like um, like you would imagine that in in your case, the word was the word of choice would be easier or more straightforward yeah. than the word that was necessarily used in the literature. And there might right. be multiple reasons for that in terms of slight or subtle differences in meaning yeah. that perhaps just aren't really that important when it comes to everyday language, but uh, become quite mm. uh, important when it comes to the sort of tedious Naturally. slogging of writing academic pieces. Um, Welcome to academia. Yeah. Um, and, and, and with that, once you have those, those little bits and pieces of languages and phrases, then that searching part just becomes so much easier. You can hone in more specifically, more directly into what you're looking for 
Right. And once again, uh, something like Google Scholar really helps with that. Um, and then Google Scholar will pop out uh, sometimes uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of articles with those yeah. words. And of course, at that point, you're probably quite overwhelmed. Uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's easy to think, oh, every single thing that is being shown to me uh, is important and yeah. it's really not yeah but yeah. uh the value there is that at least the first five or six or seven will show that uh that yes you were on the right track when it came to perhaps the words that yeah. you, you did yeah. put into the search engine 100%. because it kind of told you a little bit more about your uh about your topic of interest right right it's it, sort of taking it um, a step further obviously we've spoken about um, using search engines whether that's that's Google Scholar or mm. um, or the university's database or whatever the case may be um, once you once you found the sort of core literature um, the you know the, the big five or whatever mm. the, the main articles are in your area uh, another thing that I tell students is every journal article is just loaded with references at yes. the end and some students don't even look at it they don't they want to save on printing paper they don't even print the, the reference list but really the, the reference list of any um, big article is is a gold mine for students because exactly. that's that's really where you can just go and snowball it and you you basically just with every article you read you you've just been given you've been handed on a silver platter a bunch of additional articles that you should look at mm. um, and so I, I think that's also an important thing for for students to understand is that it's not just about finding things in a search engine every article you read is a gateway to to more articles on on a related note um Naturally, some topics have more written about them than, than others mm. do. But uh, a common challenge that, that students face is that there's just a lot that's been written mm. on their topic. They, 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 they know what they want to research. Um, but there's just loads and loads and loads and loads of uh, journal articles. Yes. And, and as, as we know, not all journals are created equally. Um, there's, there's differences in quality. And obviously, if you're undertaking research, you want your, your, your literature review and, in fact, your research to be built on, on good quality literature. So what are, what are some of the just the easy to spot things that, that students can, can pay attention to to ensure that whatever literature they're looking at, it's quality or yes. uh, on the other side, if they're, if they're seeing lo loads and loads and loads of literature and they want to sort of optimize their reading, mm. how can they sort of filter down, filter out the noise and just focus on the stuff that matters? What are the quality indicators to look out yeah, for? Yeah, that's actually an incredibly important question because um, if, you're, if you're reading a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of junk really, <laughs> then you're not going to really get yeah, closer, you, right? closer to what you're wanting to achieve. Mm. But um, it's, it's not the right shoulder right it's just not yes, the right shoulders. exactly exactly <laughs> um, different giants um, and right. uh, in this case what you're wanting to look out for are um, a couple of things the first is is, is really relevance uh, it's very tempting to just read everything that comes up uh, but you really want to make sure that right. it's actually kind of uh, within the ballpark of your of your particular topic um, but sure. the quality of the article itself can be determined by several things the first is, uh, at least at, at an initial space, the first is citations, the number of citations, especially if you wanted to figure out right. how foundational this piece was in terms of, uh, yeah. of, of where you are and maybe perhaps that little sort of nook or discipline um, in which you're sort of inserting yourself. That's a first uh, step. And it's an important step uh, if you have, if you're just wanting to sort of get the good broad overview or, or, or good piece of seminal uh, work that is uh, probably yeah. from which you're going to be, you know, sort of just jumping off yourself, essentially. Um, so that's step number one. This, this is a bit treacherous in some respects, especially if you have a very narrow focus or if you have um, a very specific context in which you're very interested in. Uh, right. For instance, perhaps you're interested in uh, a very a specific small town, right, yeah, yeah. which nobody's yeah. really uh, spoken about before. So, so, so that's where um, where you wanting to be relevant really fits yeah. in. But the citations, the number of citations, is also really important. Yeah. The nice thing about uh, about using citations more broadly is is that you can also kind of see what people were writing about 
from that article yeah because if the people that were using the article were also heading in a very similar direction to you then you can actually then you know that it's foundational for your particular topic so right, numbers of right. citations is one and and, um, and the, spot, spotting the number of, uh, of citations would be just using google scholar right type in the article name oh, and yeah. google scholar <laughs> tells you how many how many there are right Exactly. Google cool. Scholar has made it super easy for thank everyone. You, Google. Thank you, Google. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, you don't really need to go back into people's random profiles on the academic right. profiles anymore right. like, we, like we used to. Uh, so it's a little bit more straightforward now. It'll just say cited by and then it's got a number. And, um, and you will get, uh, there'll be a high level of variability there. You'll get uh, some, uh, ci some articles which are cited in the thousands and some, uh, and some that are only cited in the tens and discipline dependent in the tens is pretty good right. <laughs> but um yeah but some really foundational pieces are are often cited in the hundreds and thousands um this is also important when you're thinking about uh, about sort of where do i start uh, you're yeah. kind of wanting to start there right. um at, at the very least um and this brings me to the sort of second point is perhaps be a little bit picky about the journals or the sources from which you are citing. Right. You're right. wanting to cite from uh, journals that potentially, once again, subject topic dependent, have a relatively um, high impact factor. That's usually how journals are, are, uh, are judged, if you will. Right. Um, so a high impact factor fact to journal in uh, the sciences the journal science and nature are very high impact journals yeah, yeah. Uh, they tend to have incredibly novel potentially far-reaching uh, articles written in them mm. that are quite frequently at least some point in the future foundational to a certain direction of the discipline right Right. And so you tend to find a little bit of a correlation there between citations and the kinds of journals uh, right. in which they're written. Right. And, and how, um, sorry yeah. to, to jump in, but how do, no, no, how do we find out what the impact factor of a journal is? Is there some website that we can look at? I, yeah, I just usually just Google it. Cool. That's, that's the easiest for me. Um, almost all journals say. They're very right. quick. To, in fact, if you Google the journal, the impact factor will come up with the journal. So there you don't you even go. have to put there in there go. impact journal, in, impact factor. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, that, that's, that's pretty straightforward. Cool. Um, a, a good, uh, you know, to be honest, though, this is very dependent. Uh, local, small local journals will have lower impact factors purely because they're at a local level. Right, that right. doesn't mean that they're a bad journal. Right. That means that they're a specific journal. So quite often, if your research topic is specific or reaching into a specific context, make sure that you are thinking about the journals that are specific to your context right, too, right. even though they might have low impact factors, right, because right. those are important for you. Right, so, so basically, it's quite quite logical that the more niche a journal is, the more specialized it is around a certain topic. Exactly. The lesser audience it has, the lower impact score it's going to have, but it could have the greatest relevance for you. So, so exactly. I guess the lesson is don't 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 be superficial. Don't judge a journal by its impact. Factor, Pretty right? much. Re relevance <laughs> is key. <laughs> right. right. Pretty much. Okay, don't cool. judge so, a journal so, by its impact factors. Definitely something for. There you go. That that is the takeaway for this video. That's the takeaway. <laughs> right. So so to recap, um, uh, how the question? How do uh, you find journal articles. Starting point is Google Scholar. Mm. Get started on Google Scholar, um, potentially also hand in hand with Wikipedia to give you an idea of what are the sort of key pieces of, of literature in that space. Um, dig into Google Scholar. You can then, if you can't get access to those articles through Google Scholar, you can try to get access to them through your university. Mm. Um, once you've read some of the articles, pay attention to the reference lists and snowball that out. And then to judge the quality, have a look at citation score or uh, yes, or number of citations exactly. and uh, impact factor. But don't be too judgmental on the impact factor, right? Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Awesome. So let's get on to the next one. Okay, on to our fourth and final question for mm. this episode. And this is probably the question that we get asked the most. 
And it's probably a question that you're not really going to like the answer to because we don't have a great answer for you. So this question is, how do I structure the literature review? I've got all this literature. I've got, I've, I've synthesized it. I, I have it all in my mind. I, I, know, I, know, I know what I want to say, but I just don't know how to structure it. I don't know how to put it down onto paper. So yeah. Karen, a wise one, please tell us. <laughs> How does a student decide to structure their literature review? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, as you said, uh, this is it's not going to be the most satisfying answer, but uh, the, this is really the case of uh, skinning a cat. There are many different ways to do this. Um, it and depends. It depends. Yeah, the worst kind of answer and the only kind of answer you usually get from academics. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I think there are uh, some some broad things that you can do. Uh, the, first, the first way that uh, we see um, relatively frequently, and this probably just helps in terms of making, uh, collating your ideas into little sort of easy digestible packages, is to theme, theme the literature theme your theme what's important so for instance i I think earlier we spoke about methodologies maybe have a little methodology section or or um, a various or or various themes that have inspired the piece of literature or maybe a a collated overview of uh, the different uh, uh, fields from which your piece of research is being inspired so if you sort of theme it that is nice because that instead of just you know if you've read hundreds of articles instead of like using hundreds of articles all at once you can kind of say okay well these kind of fit under this theme these kind of fit under that Mm -hmm. theme and it really helps you in terms of organizing your thoughts another way and i also like this way because it has a a certain narrative style to it if you will is to um is to actually do it chronologically. Talk about the history. Talk about um, uh, where this where this idea has come from in a sort of chronological way. This is nice mm. in terms of figuring out or collating or synthesizing the debates that have happened before perhaps you're entering into this debate, right? So right, maybe you'll right. say something like, oh, in the 1980s, this was the topic at hand. This is kind of what uh, person X said, but person Y disagreed because of that. Then person Z yeah. came in with this information, but here I am and I actually think person X was right all along, right? Uh, so, yeah. you know, you can kind yeah. of, uh, if you structure it that way, there's a little bit of a drama to it. Don't be too dramatic in a literature yeah, review, but yeah. it's a little bit uh, easier to read <laughs> in that case. Yeah, th- there's a narrative, mm-hmm. right? There's a narrative exactly. of a story unfolding. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is kind of sometimes a little bit nicer to write um, as well, mm-hmm. just from uh, depending on on you as a person, and also depending perhaps on where you're, what kind of thing you're doing <laughs> in terms of your mm-hmm. literature. Mm-hmm. Uh, some things really some some uh, pieces of research really don't lend themselves well to this. Uh, so, sure, sure. so you kind of just want to, uh, to, to think about what suits you. Mm. My two things that I like to do in terms of not just uh, writing a literature review, I've written my, my fair share of dissertations, but uh, obviously in terms sure. of writing more broadly, um, one of the things that I like to do is to start off broad and then narrow in the focus. That right, is uh, right. helpful for several reasons because um, it it firstly allows you to get all of those things that you read that you thought were pretty important or oh, you don't want to actually not reference this person because they're so foundational in the field, for instance. Um, yeah. kind, of, kind of just gets them out of the way, if you will. It's kind of like, yeah. okay, well, this is where the field really is, um, right? Yeah. And... Yeah. Um, but uh, but let's move in a bit, and then you can kind of move in a little bit further, and then move in a little bit further still. And uh, this this works well when it comes to uh, perhaps uh, thinking about the broad overview, the meaning, the overall purpose of perhaps maybe not the discipline as a whole, but this area, this niche of research as a whole, and then kind mm-hmm. of uh, figuring it out perhaps into the context that perhaps you're interested in. Maybe you're interested right, in right. Um, in a particular question, but apply to South Africa, then you're kind of wanting to sort of uh, hone in the research into the South African context as you go. Right. So, from, from, from sort of international down into exactly. the, the national context. Right. Exactly. Cool. So cool. That, that's that's nice. Um, one rule of thumb, though, is is that I like to, to, to 
to say or to encourage is to you is to is to know that you need to end the literature review once again without too many surprises. You're kind of wanting to yeah. uh, to 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 set the scene, but at the end of the literature review, you want to say, "And this is where I stand. This is where my right. piece of research fits into the broader picture." Or this is where this is right. where we are. And now we're going to jump off into it, into the methodology, into into my area right, of research. Right. So you're wanting to end in a way that essentially reaffirms, highlights, and hones in to where you are, and where your right. dissertation is going. Um, and that's right. and even whether whether you do it from starting off broad to ending off specifically, or whether you do it in terms of themes, themes, themes. But here I am collating the themes, then that's fine. Yeah. However you do it, yeah. as long as you end off with that in mind, then, um, then that's good. And mm. what's really mm. helpful in all of these different approaches is to make sure that your definitions are defined as early as possible. Because you know, yeah. yeah, right. I explain, say it all the time. Explain yeah. what the big words mean Precisely. before you use them, right? Precisely. <laughs> right. If you're using a piece of jargon, start off explaining what that jargon is. I, I've seen this play out in, in varying ways, uh, sometimes quite bizarrely. Sometimes people will <laughs> use the jargon and then only explain it later. And um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is, which is, which is, a, it's, it's just a little aggravating, but isn't um, as, uh, as strange as the second approach that people sometimes have, which is to use a completely different word and then suddenly halfway through the literature review decide to change the word completely and use the piece of jargon. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is um, which is an unusual approach, and then of course throughout, then they sort of hop between both words <laughs> until right. the end. So uh, don't One, do that. Pick your jargon and stick with it. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> right. I think part of the reason it's so difficult to answer this question of of how do I structure my literature review is is because the structure needs to flow from the i guess the research questions and, exactly. and whatever it is that you're researching so there's no one structure because there's no one research question there's no one research topic exactly. um, and so it really does depend so much on what is the area you're researching what is the 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 um the the thing you're trying to find out and and in answering in in attempting to answer that question the structure should emerge mm. from that and i think one 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 potential practical tip that might be useful for students is that if there have been uh, other dissertations that have uh, been written that are similar to yours um, or at least similar to your topic or asking similar kinds of questions there are loads of dissertation and thesis databases online that you can go and you can download those and you can take some inspiration from them there's exactly nothing's ever going to be a perfect fit but you can at least get some practical inspiration and you can see how or one what the different options are in terms of structure and two mm -hmm. how that plays out when you read through their literature review you can see a well, did this work well or didn't it work well? Was I lost exactly. as a reader? So, so you can take some inspiration from from other dissertations and perhaps even from journal articles. You can see how they approach the topic outright. All right, so I think uh, that's about as much clarity as we're going to get to our fourth and final question <laughs> of how do you structure a literature review. Hopefully you got some guidance <laughs> from that. Um, but that's pretty much all we have time for today. Thank you so much for your time and for dropping them <laughs> knowledge bombs on us today. Karen, really appreciate having you It's an absolute pleasure here. being here. And I, I hope I was helpful to, to some of you guys out there. Um, it was a pleasure chatting, Derek. Of course. <laughs> Well, that wraps up this episode of Grad Coach TV. For those of you watching, remember that Karen is one of our super rock star grad coaches who helps students just like you every day with their research. So if you're struggling through a dissertation, a thesis, or any sort of research project, head on over to gradcoach.com. I'll link to that below this video. And you can book a free consultation with any of our friendly coaches just like Karen. So there you have it. In this video, we've covered what the literature review is, 
what the purpose and the function of the literature review is, how to find high quality uh, articles and resources for your literature review, and of course, how to structure your literature review. If you'd like some more information on the literature review or on anything research related, be sure to check out the Grad Coach blog. That's at gradcoach.com forward slash blog. I'll also include the link to that below this video. If you've got any questions about anything we discussed today, please do leave a comment below the video. If you enjoyed the video, please give us a thumbs up. It really helps. Equally, subscribe to the channel. You'll probably find the rest of the content pretty useful if you're writing a dissertation or thesis or any sort of research project. So from me, Derek, this is a grad coach signing out.